Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, hi, my name is Thomas, Thomas Weible, co-founder from Flex Optics, uh, and I'm more in the technical environment for optical transceivers. So, um, yes, it's me between you and the beer. It's not exactly uh, true, because Uli and uh, Daniel and uh, Andreas from Core Backbone already opened their fridge, so if you want some beer, get to their booth, get it, and maybe you come back. Um, and the presentation already started, that's great. Um, <laughs> we go back here. So I prepared that presentation. Uh, it's, it's more an out, out view, an outlook, what will come in the next couple uh, years, especially which will be implemented beginning of next year, mid of next year. So it's about 400 gigabit, 400 gigabit transceivers and also the dedicated switches for that. Um, I, I had a presentation at a RIPE meeting and Aaron, Aaron Huge from Six Connect came to me and said, hey Thomas, better, I have a better title for your presentation. Uh, why don't you call it just from, from Cyclops to Triclops? And you, you may understand it now uh, when, I, when I do the presentation because this presentation has two parts. One is the theory part and there are the Cyclops and the Triclops explained and then later on there will be a hands-on part. So let's start with the theory part, and uh, I think that's something every one of you knows. It's a typical shape of a rectangle signal of, of a single bit representing there, and this bit has two events. So we got a low event down there, and we got a high event up there. That's pretty straightforward. And this type of signal, rectangle shape, is used for today's uh, transmi transmission speeds up to 100 gigabit uh, when, when you look on the signal level. Now, uh, some of you might be familiar with the term of an optical eye diagram or an eye diagram, but when I talk to people, uh, a lot of people know the term and how to write it, but nobody can explain me exactly what are the innards of it, or they have seen it, but why is it needed and uh, what is the purpose of it? And that's what I want to wanna show now. Uh, for sure, it's what you want to have is you want an open, nice, clear eye. Uh, that's for sure, what, that's your goal, but how do you achieve that? Um, when we have, for example, a sequence of three bits in a row, an example here, it's uh, uh, three bits starting with zero, one, zero, and those three bits uh, go through two different events, either to the low, uh, like the zero, or the zero here, or the high event, like this, uh, the one here. Um, having three bits in a row, and if you do your math, two to the power of three will end up with eight. So you have eight different uh, scenarios, uh, how your three bits can be rep rep represented. Uh, for example, down there, zero, one, one, or like here, one, zero, zero, or even one, one, one. And now the interesting part is when you overlap that, you will get something like this down there. Um, so you, we overlap basically all those shapes from the previous slide, and that's half the way to an optical or to an eye diagram. So when, when you look up there, that, that's actually an eye diagram made from a 100 gigabit transceiver uh, from the transmitter side, and we, we can clearly see those shapes uh, from, from the high event to the low event up to the high event, and uh, all, all the other way around. Um, you might wonder why it's not a rectangle shape any longer, and uh, as we are talking about a signal for a 100 gigabit transceiver running at a speed of 25 gigabit, it's, it's not a rectangle any longer, it's more a sinus, and that's what we basically can measure here. Uh, because it, it, it's damn fast, basically. Um, the second part of an optical eye diagram is this nice shape in there. It's, it's called a mask, uh, and this mask actually makes an eye diagram an eye diagram, because what you want to avoid is, or what you want to make clear is, your, your transmitter needs to, to be really precisely from a high state down to a low state, and up to a high state again, or the other way around, or even keeps up there, because if it would cross it, the receiver side would have an, an issue to distinguish was it a high event or a low event, because we always have, have a transmitter and a receiver. And if the transmitter transmits crap, the receiver can only detect crap. Uh, if the transmitter transmits a, a proper signal and the fiber makes crap out of, this, uh, of, of, of that signal, then the receiver still can detect crap. So, um, the main target is to have a clear eye, a clear eye, an open eye, and you, what you really want to avoid is a dodgy eye. Uh, dodgy eyes are even in, in real life not really helpful. This was me trying to play, uh, oops, uh, playing to try ice hockey, but I was not very successful. Um, 
Now, when it comes to 400 gigabit, and back to my theory at the beginning, we have now a rectangle uh, which is a little bit in, uh, in, in, in sections or split it up in sections. So what I did there is now I took my rectangle shape and I put two intermediate steps in there. So we got now a H1, H2 event, and like our, H, uh, our previous H event or high event, it's now H3. So we have now four events in one, um, in one um, 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 signal level there. And the great thing is, with those four events in one, uh, in one pulse, basically, we can represent two bits. And that's, so we kept the frequency, but we doubled the amount of data we put in there. And how would such an eye diagram look like? And it's more a monster. So this monster has now three eyes. Uh, we have four events in there. And um, the, the good thing is, we, we have now two bits on the same frequency, so we just double the amount of the, the data rate just to the fact that we have those four events in our signal. Uh, this is called a four-level pulse amplitude modulation, and the acronym is also PAM4. Um, this is one key component when it comes to 400 gigabit, and um, um, so, so looking at 100 gigabit now using PAM4, we would have, we would be at 200 gigabit. So what drives the 400 gigabit, that's coming on the uh, further slides. So more to the hands-on, uh, how is this implemented in practice? I need to do a recap on the 100 gigabit. So when we open up a 100 gigabit transceiver, um, and basically when you open up any transceiver, they pretty much look like this one. So we got an electrical side on the left side, we got here the golden finger connectors connecting to your host, to your router, to your switch, whatever. And uh, for 100 gigabit transceivers, it's m the majority of them are dri driven by 4 times 25 gigabit. So we have four lanes connecting from our host, which is over there, um, connecting to our transceiver. And these four lanes running at 25 gigabit are connecting to an optical engine also running at 4 times 25 gigabit. That's current 100 gigabit technology. Now, coming to 400 gigabit, it looks a little bit different. Um, the inerts it's basically double the amount of lanes. So what we have learned in the, in the theory part, we, are, we are double the, the amount of gigabits we are doing, so we're doing 50 gigabit now, um, but still keeping the frequency uh, on 25 gigabit, but we have a modulation, PAM4, so we got uh, 50 gigabit there per lane, but we got now eight lanes instead of four, so eight times 50 gigabit gives 400 gigabit. So our host, drives eight times 50 gigabit into the transceiver. And on the other side, there is an optical engine running also eight lasers, eight receivers running at a, uh, with a speed of 50 gigabit. This will be the first generation. The second generation, that's the most interesting one, looks like this. So the electrical side will kept at eight times 50 gigabit, but then there will be placed a gearbox taking those eight lanes, combine it, and the gearbox is basically an AC or a chip, um, combines it to four times 100 gigabit. And this four times 100 gigabit are implemented also in optics, so we got four lasers running at 100 gigabit and four receivers at 100 gigabit. Now the question would be, hey, why don't you, why have you, uh, why do we place a gearbox here and reduce the amount of lanes and running electrically also four times 100 gigabit? And the answer is quite simple, it's money or it's costs. So it's cheaper to produce and build a chip on that, on that transceiver instead of increasing the frequency because we, if, we, uh, if we would run here 100 gigabit, we would need to increase the frequency and this would influence that the PCB, what we need, especially the PCB material, is really expensive. So we can't take regular PCB material and longer, we need something like uh, Teflon or ceramic and the longer the traces are, the more cost of it, it gets. So it's even cheaper just to build a, a chip, place it on a transceiver, and drive your optical engine. Now, in terms of the form factors, what we will see there in the future, and I also brought an example with me, um, uh, that, that's a QS of PDD, the, the, the second one. So we, we do already know the QSFP28, it's a 100 gigabit transceiver, and uh, 
um, the, 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 the next 400 gigabit one is the QSFP DD. It's a little bit longer, slightly longer than the QSFP 28, but it has some really nice advantage. They are compatible to each other. And uh, I, I personally like compatibility uh, because when you look at this QSFP DD slot, it has two connector connecting rows. And uh, in, in a QSFPDD slot running at, four, at a speed of 400 gigabit, you can plug in a QSFP28. And how is this made? Pretty simple, only the first row. So when you take that QSFP28, plug it into such a QSFPDD slot, only the first row is connected and the second isn't connected at all. Um, that's how you can run a 100 gigabit transceiver in a 400 gigabit slot. The second uh, type of uh, transceiver which will drive 400 gigabit is called the OSFP. It's uh, slightly bigger than a QSF PDD, a little bit higher, but it has a nice advantage, which we'll see at the end when it comes to the power consumption. It has an integrated heatsink. Um, yeah. I also mentioned the size here, and um, I, the, the reason why I mention it, it, it's the portion which sticks out of our first uh, of, of front unit of our switcher router. I mentioned here 35 millimeters, and bear that in mind, because when we have seen the first initial installation six, seven years ago with 10 gig DWDM SFP pluses, they had that huge heatsink at the front part unit, and we got claims or complaints from customers saying, hey, that's great, we got now DWDM. Uh, running at, at a speed of 10 gigabit, but we can't close the, do the, the, the door of our rack any longer um, because this transceiver is way too long. Um, the bad news are for 400 gigabit, it will stay like this. So we, the definition is it can stick out up to 35 millimeters. And the reason why I mentioned this is you have those 35 mill millimeters of max of the transceiver portion, then you have at least 50 millimeters for your plug, and then you should should give that fiber also a little bit of bend radius. So you will need 135 up to 150 millimeter space in front of your first rack unit up to your first door or to, to, to your door basically. And when you do your math, you will figure out, oh, looking at later switches or one U switches, they will have a depth of six, seven, eight hundred millimeters. So the, the second rack unit will be somewhere at 700 millimeters, and then you need a little bit spacing for the AC power or DC power wiring. Uh, you might end up not uh, having sufficient space with a, a thousand millimeter rack any longer, so you might better go for 1200 millimeters, uh, instead staying with a uh, thousand millimeters with the latest uh, technology which is coming up there. Um, so what, what can we connect now here on, on, on the right side to a transceiver? For sure, we can do legacy 400 gigabit to 400 gigabit. That's straightforward. Uh, that's what we have done in the past with 100 gigabit, with 10 gig or 40 gig, pretty straightforward. But um, from the point of the definition for the 400 gigabit, also some really nice applications are possible. And this is this breakout scenario. And I'm talking especially here about the second generation of the 400 gigabit transceivers and not the first generation, so it's more the second generation. So it doesn't matter if it's QSF PDD or OSF, OSFP, both will support that breakout scenario. So we got on the left side our 400 gigabit switch, and we can break it out in four times 100 gigabit, and this 100 gigabit is on a single lambda. Um, so we have four lambdas coming out here, and each of them is driving to, to a 100 gigabit host directly. So for QSFP28, there will be an improvement. It's, it's basically a result of the 400 gigabit development. So we take uh, uh, the development of 400 gigabit technology and squeeze it into a QSFP28 form factor running at 100 gigabit. And then we got a single lambda solution running it in a form factor of QSFP28. But that's not the end of, 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 of the road. We will also see there are new form factors for dedicated 100 gigabit, and that's either the micro QSFP or even the SFP DD. Uh, DD is basically double density. Um, so there will be some 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 new transceivers coming. Now, um, in terms of of, of uh, standardization, and that's something really important to mention, even in, at the current 100 gigabit, there is still a lag. So that's the current situation when it comes to standardization when we uh, look at 100 gigabit. 
basically, for the first two one, there is no standardization. Quite a lot of you have installed this type of application, either parallel single mode solutions, four times 25 gigabit to do a breakout, or even run CWDM uh, wavelengths um, uh, on a CLR4 or CWDM4 transceiver. So we have a spacing of each laser of 20 nanometers to each other. And the main reason why we would do this is because it's cheaper than pure LR4. LR4 has a LAN WDM with a spacing of 5 nanometers from each laser to, to each other. Um, but this was really a lack of IEEE because they only standardized LR4. And that's one main reason when you look at today's exchange points, for example, because they only offer one side of interface, they offer you LR4. They don't offer you CWDM4, CLR4 or whatever because that's the only one which is standardized. And that's the great thing about standards. Um, for sure, they take a while until they are standard, uh, but um, you can rely on it. So when I'm talking uh, an LR4 and you're talking an LR4, then this will work and we are talking the same language. Now, these lessons were learned for 400 gigabit and the roadmap for 400 gigabit looks a little bit different. So for that breakout scenario, uh, which is already there, we have now a standard, it's called DR4. So we have four times 100 gigabit and that's Basically, when I jump back on the slides, when I jump to that slide, that's basically the DR4 scenario. So you can run um, with DR4 the 4 times 100 gigabit uh, on, on four dedicated lambdas. Now, an interesting part, and that's mainly for data center interconnections, uh, is uh, for dedicated 400 gigabit in data centers. Um, is the FR4 up to a distance of two kilometers because um, two kilometers is a, is a decent size within a data center on single mode fiber. And uh, here you can see it, it, it's also using the CWDM4 wavelength grid. So we have a spacing of 20 nanometers. And why was this implemented or why was it standardized? Costs. It, that, that's the only reason, because it's way cheaper to produce a transceiver with, uh, with four lasers in there having a spacing of 20 nanometers instead of building a transceiver with lasers having a spacing of five nanometers. It's way more e difficult to build those five nanometer spacing to keep the laser stabilized. Uh, and the more difficult it gets, the, the, the more expensive it gets. And for sure, we will see LR4. Uh, up to 10 kilometers, also for 400 gigabit. Uh, second generation, and LR8 and L FR8 is the first generation with the 8 times 50 gigabit. Um, on the plug side, um, and that's uh, also uh, almost the end of the presentation, is um, there will be new plugs. Um, on the, the left side, that's that's basically the current situation. We got MPO, mainly you have seen it in, in multi-mode installations. Uh, the MPO with eight fibers lined up and it's capable to handle 12 fibers in each single block. Um, the situation even gets worse because for 400 gigabit we need eight lanes and we need eight times TX, eight times RX. So we need the blocks are able to handle 16 fibers. So there will be an MPO 16. The great news is it will have a new keying, so you can't mix it up. But it's still MPO and uh, it's still tricky to handle. Um, the good thing is on single mode, and that's the maturity I assume what, you, what we are talking here is, is it, it will have LC uh, still. And for newer applications, and when I'm talking about new applications, we have seen the four times 100 gigabit is doable with 400 gigabit. For sure, it's one time 400 gigabit doable, or even think about two times 200 gigabit. That's also doable, but how do you want to... Um, uh, terminate that two times two in a gigabit. That's where this scenario comes into play. So we have two, tr basically two transceivers in one transceiver. So two 200 gigabit transceivers in one housing, uh, and it's called a CS plug, or in other words, it's an LC double density. So half the size of an LC double X. Finally, um, power, and that's that's a, a, a tricky point, and also again. Lessons were learned here from the 100 gigabit. When you look at today's 100 gigabit transceiver, they are able to handle four, five, may, some of them six watts. Now, you and every one of us thinks, okay, we, we want to reduce power. On the transceiver side, it's all it's actually the other way around. We want to consume as much power as we can, because the more power we can consume, the more technology we can place into a transceiver. 
And when you think about 100 gigabit technology, a big lag of 100 gigabit is, and when you look at a pluggable, is you don't get coherent DWDM solutions there pretty much. There are solutions, yes, but you look at CFP or CFP2, way bigger transceiver, and they can consume again way more power. I'm talking about the nice form factors like QSOP28. Um, so this is one really uh, a lesson which was learned for, for the 400 gigabit standardization and development to put as much as power into that transceiver and to give you some figures maybe back from your high school physics. We got a golden finger connector at the back of such a transceiver and we're running at a voltage of 3.3 volt. Doing your math with 20 or 15 watts, you will end up with, uh, with a couple of amps or 5, 6 amps uh, just on that single uh, connector. So that's something which needs to be handled or, or and even the host needs to provide it. That's one thing. The other thing is we put in a lot of power in there. We can drive components like a signal processor doing uh, longer distances than 10 kilometers like we want to have coherent solution in a 400 gigabit transceiver. Now the other thing is we put in there up to maybe like on the OSFP 15 watts or QSFP DD 12 watts uh, we want to get rid of that power again because it's heat at the end of the day. So the, the power we put in there will, will end up in heat. And when you do again the math, uh, look at the latest switches I have seen, they have a 1U around uh, 36 ports um, carrying 15 watts each. So you will have around 500 watts just on heat dissipation for only for the transceiver part. Not taking in consideration there is uh, CPU, RAM, uh, and what's a switch makes a switch. So you might end up with a switch running at one at one kilowatt at on one U, um, and that that's that's important to to, to think about. Um, for, at the moment, the OSFP has, has a slight advantage compared to QSFPDD because it's just a little bit bigger. It's bigger. It can get rid of way more heat. Um, there have been first strides driving an OSFP up to 20 watts and then an QSFPDD up to 15 or even 18 watts. We will see where the, where the race will go. Um, the, main, the, the, the main goal is definitely going beyond LR, 10 kilometers, reaching something like ZR, getting there 80 kilometers or even more, having coherent DWDM in a 400 gigabit transceiver. That's the main, main target. And um, yeah, we might gonna see the first uh, 400 gigabit switches by the beginning of uh, 2019, by next year. I have already seen, an not an installation, but a demo case from Arista with OSFP. It was running um, and yeah, we will see what's, what's gonna be next year. But I have also heard that Cisco announced a platform running a QSFP DD somehow. I, I don't have figures when they will release it. Um, yeah, that's where we are at the moment. Um, that's, that's basically it about the 400 gigabit. It, it still leaves a lot of freedom for us because we take care about the microcontroller inside uh, of, a, of a transceiver. And um, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>